Hey, everybody, everybody, man. Oh, man, the Chevys, you back at Strong Inspirations. I'm Anthony Brogdon. You know what I do. I just give it to you straight, no chaser. Oh, my God. I bring on these people. Now, I don't bring them on. I just do what I can to find them, and then I beg them to come on the channel and tell this good Black history. Cause there's a ton of it out there understandably everybody got a story so we're gonna keep it rolling this is not a black history month thing this is 365 and we do it internationally too now i got some people overseas that have come on and we got more of them coming on to tell the story not just black history in america let's go all over this diaspora all right you know, I'm Anthony Brogdon. I'm the guy that just kind of come up with this thing and came up with this concept and I'm rolling. I'm having so much fun. I don't know what to do. I enjoy this. I enjoy it. And, and, and these have become my people, these guests. I'm, I'm following up with them. I'm, I'm seeing what we can do after this show, right? And I got big plans. You watch it. I'm going to be announcing some things real soon. I'm announcing them becoming like a little more activist. You watch. I'm announcing things real soon. But really what I want you to do right now, and it's real easy, is hit the subscribe button on the channel. Subscribe to the channel. We don't get no information. All you do is hit the button and it's, a, it's that's it. I really appreciate that. It helped me get my numbers up because then I know people are watching me. I want you to hit the like bell on this video. Watch this guy here, good looking guy. He gonna tell you something that I know you don't know. You ain't gonna know this. I ain't heard of this man he about to talk about but he's significant. Hit the like button, hit the notifications bell because then you get notified, ding or something on the email or something like that, that I got a new video I just posted and I'm doing four, five, six of them a week. You wanna be on the, on, the, on the tip. And then tell somebody about Strong Inspirations. Don't keep this to yourself. You up in the bar and everything, you running around, you got a table around you and you tell it what you saw on the channel and then don't tell them where you saw it. Don't do that. Let people know, let this thing flow. Let it go viral as they say, strong inspirations. The other things that I want you to do, this is my personal tip. This is how I kind of make my living, not kind of, it is. I'm a filmmaker. I did this documentary called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. Slaves that went to college. Black men there in the 1800s. It's all in my film. And it's streaming on Amazon because I know people don't have DVD players no more. So you can, this the DVD. So you can just get it, it's on Amazon. It's called Business in the Black. Type Business in the Black, type my name and it'll come up. You can watch it on your laptop, your iPhone your smart TV, wherever. And then I would like, really like it. If you buy my book, I'll autograph it. My off writers has not set in yet. So I buy my book, Black Business Book. It's got over 200 facts. And I tell you what, if you know everything that I put in this book, if you do not learn anything new, I give your money back. I figure you that smart that you don't need to pay the, the, the few dollars that I'm asking for this book. Or buy two, three copies and give it to somebody and y'all talk about it together. Make it part of your book club. And how about this? I list 13 slaved owned businesses in my book. I give you the name and what they did and then they use the money to buy their freedom. It's in this book, all right? It's called Black Business Book. Get you a copy today. I'll mail it the same day that I get the order. Yeah, because I want you to have it. I know what's in the book. <laughs> you know what I mean, my friends? I need you to have this. And then tell them teachers. And for every 10th book I sell, I donate the one to a school. You order 10 books, I donate one to a school in your honor. How about that? They need to know this. I've donated over 300 books so far. All right, people need to see this and understand this. And it's an easy read, too. So get you a copy of that. And then, you know, my man, he's sitting there, he patient, he looking good. He said, hey man, I got to go, I got to tell us. Let me tell you one more thing. I use that word strong a lot. Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. 
And that's my introduction to my guest today. Strong brother, come on in, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself. Let's get it on. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for having me on, Mr. Brogdon. I appreciate you. You know, I, I haven't been to Detroit yet, but I feel like I'm going this morning. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to give it to you, but when you come, you got to wear them gaiters, man. <laughs> you okay. got to get you some red gaiters and red pants. All right. <laughs> That's how we do it in the D. Some All right. But yeah, I'm uh, uh, Rodney Dawson. Uh, I'm currently the curator uh, of education at the Greensboro History Museum, also home to the International Civil Rights Museum uh, and the ANT. I call them the ANT Four, or the, some people call them the Greensboro Four. In February 1, 1960, they uh, did the sit in at the Woolworths. Uh, that uh, wasn't the, the first one, but it was the one that created a lot of notoriety and kind of sparked uh, that movement uh, throughout the 60s, you know, further. Sit okay, in. hold on. Before you go there, man, let me get on you a little bit, man. Where, where you from and how you get to be like how you are, man? What, what, you always well, love history or something like that? always love history, but, you know, coming out of high school, I went into the military, got out of the military, got into uh, radio, went to college, um, military paid for it. Then um, uh, after the recession of 2008, um, the radio stations were the first ones to take the hit. And I had someone call me looking for, a, a, for they knew I knew a bunch of people. If I could recommend someone for this position at a school and I recommended myself. And so I taught for 10 years and then I left, you know, went and got a master's. From the illustrious North Carolina A and T State oh. University, Aggie Pride. Yeah, you go. And then um, uh, when I was uh, getting my master's and uh, started working on my doctorate as well, got an EDS and started working on my doctorate. That's when I left education in 2018 because I I was 12 hour days. I was gonna lose my license with those kids. But yeah. uh, so, but so, um, man, that, uh, man, that's commendable, man. So you 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 love history and and that's that's been your life's work now. Well, I've always enjoyed it. I've just worked in other fields, but I've always incorporated history. And so when this position became available, it was a way for me to have pretty much a nine to five. And I was able, have been able to incorporate all my backgrounds, whether it's military, teaching, radio. I've, I've kind of brought all those experiences yeah. into this job today. Okay, how about this one? Is there a, now you grew up where? High Point, North Carolina. So I mean, is, is there a Black History moment in High Point, North Carolina? Is there something there that uh, y'all remember uh, back in the day growing up? Well, they've had a, a few things. Um, I would say notable people would be John Coltrane or okay. uh, Fantasia. They're from High Point. Um, there's been some efforts to make John Coltrane's home a national historic site. Yeah, it's kind of unbelievable that it's that it's not already. Yeah, uh, but Green it's been all over Winston Salem's a nearby city, but Greensboro's kind of known for that center place, the centerpiece for social justice here in this area. But but that, that, that was there slavery in High Point though? Wasn't it slavery there? Um, yeah, they had uh, uh, enslaved people in High Point. Um, yeah, I like we didn't have we didn't have um, plantations per se. You know, it became a furniture city. And so there were some folks that had could afford to uh, purchase uh, folks and enslave them, uh, but for the most part, it wasn't a plantation. A lot of plantations around. This because there's not a lot of urban farming in High Point. No, not at all. You know, it, like I say, it became an industrial city, uh, pretty much in, in the mid 1800s. Became a really? furniture. It was really. It's still known as the furniture capital of the world. Now there's places like Mexico and China that have yeah. uh, put a dent into that. Yeah. Uh, but at one time, if you wanted furniture, uh, you would cut, and they still do it. There's two markets every year. You would come to this furniture market and you would see celebrities like Oprah Winfrey and all your major really? come here and twice a year and, and for the furniture market. So okay, it was, one more was question on you. Did your folks work in the furniture industry? Everybody black kind of did some furniture work. A lot of folks in and around High Point. That's how you made a living. My grandfather, who didn't graduate high school, but was able to raise a family send some kids to college by working at one of the furniture plants in High Point. Mm. And when you say furniture, that's chairs, sofas? Chairs, tables. sofas, uh, you know, bedding furniture, living room furniture, a lot of office furniture, you name it. Oh, really? And so oh, okay. people will come here, buy the furniture for their showrooms. So they oh. come here, buy it in bulk, they ship it out to their showrooms and, oh. and sell it. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, but High Point, is it near the water or something like that? It's, it's not no Gullah Geechee type territory. No, that's, no. That's... It, yeah, we're in the Piedmont of North Carolina, kind of in the middle. So we're two hours from the beach, two hours, less than two hours from the mountains. Oh. So we're, we're smack dab in the middle. I got you. I and it's uh, you. Guilford County. 
and the, oh, cap, okay. the city seat, the county seat is in Greensboro. Used to be in High Point, but it moved over 100 years ago oh, to, okay. to Greensboro. Okay. All right. Well, I know that was a story that uh, you want to tell. Let, let, I'm, let, let's, let's get it on, man. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, I want to kind of set up the foreground a little bit if I can. But yeah, um, this area where I am was founded by some Quakers. Now, hold on. And, you, you're um, in Greensboro. Right, right. Okay, the area in Greensboro. Okay. Yeah, Guilford County, and uh, then we got an area west of us in Winston Salem, home of Winston Salem State. Moravians founded that area, but here it was Quakers, and although Quakers, they, they had Quakers that owned slaves. Don't get me wrong. No, they, no, they didn't. They, they did. They had some. Some would bomb. Some would purchase uh, 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 enslaved folks just to set them free. But there were some that owned them. They worked in their homes, worked in their fields. So. Mm. Um, uh, that's a lot of folks have said that, but they did. But one of the things the Quakers did impress upon, they, they had this uh, belief that God is in every person. And one of the things they impressed upon this area was education. So Greensboro, because of this emphasis on education, always wanted to kind of set itself apart from other Southern cities. They didn't want to be like Spartan, South Carolina. They want to be different than Birmingham or, or Charlotte. And so they kind of went out of the. Hold on, let me stop you there. I, I, I don't mean no disrespect. When you say different, different in what way? They didn't want to be the typical Southern city. They wanted to seem sophisticated. They didn't want to be typical Southern city to be so racist against Black people? Racist and just more um, uh, agrarian, more uh, farming. They wanted okay. to have a sophistication okay. to it. I got you. I got and you. And so they thought, okay, in like the things that you would hear that hap would happen in Birmingham or other places, they would say, well, that doesn't happen here. And, you know, and they would often mistake uh, quiet for peace, as Martin Luther King used to talk about. And it wasn't. Oh, really? And so, um, but they thought education was the way. So they went out of their way to bring a college here for women. Uh, they outbid uh, an, another area, Charlotte Mecklenburg area, in what they call a triangle area, which is Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill. They outbid them to bring North Carolina Agriculture and Mechanical College here, which the later became North Carolina A and T. Okay. Uh, and then they also pushed; it just kind of set a trend to push for education to fund these middle schools and these elementaries and things like that. For not just white people, but for black people in particular primarily for whites, but also for blacks. So okay. the bulk of the money went to white schools. And then there were some, they did set up some schools for, uh, for blacks. Um, okay. Now, before that, they had a guy named, two guys named Caesar and Moses Cone that came down here from uh, Pennsylvania. And they were migrants from Eastern Europe. And uh, they started a textile industry called Cone Mills, became the, made Greensboro, them and a couple other companies, in 1895, they came down, but eventually they made Greensboro the largest producing textile industry in the world. Now, these are white guys. White guys. Okay. All right. And so, uh, but it set up kind of a patriarchal kind of industry here. It took us from, we used to be big in the nurseries and farming. It took us from that to industry because we were producing textile for, for the world. And, but it set up a style where you had this hierarchy. You had the uh, the Cone Brothers, and you had a system set up of businesses where you had this kind of a, a rich white guys owning this business, but they want to subject their workers to kind of, um, we're your, your, your patriarchs, we're your fathers. So we know what's best for you, and we're going to dictate how society goes in this area. Mm. So because we brought in this system, you know, it was they had these mills. So they knew they wanted to bring people here and keep them here so they would put up softball fields and build their own schools and their own stores. And they had these mill towns. And of course they were segregated, but they had some towns that were, mill towns were primarily African-American and, so, and uh, other mill towns were all white. And they would hire African-Americans, but they wouldn't have the same jobs. They would often have more hazardous conditions. If you ever came to the Greensboro History Museum, you could see how the black workers would come out with all this soot and dirt and chemicals on them. And uh, white workers were having picnics, but the blacks were getting a fraction of the pay. Yeah. And so you have this in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and you have this system that's supporting that, saying we want to keep things the same, you know. But you have this infrastructure that's been laid, that's been laid laid down to build up education. And you know, and I was telling you off mic that I'm working on my doctorate, and when you look up education, the Latin word, the root word for education is educer. E-D-U-C-E-R-E, which to means to lead out, lead someone to their fullest potential. 
So if you're truly educating someone, you're leading them to their fullest potential. I got you. So, I love it. So you have these schools, Bennett College, HBCU for women. You have uh, North Carolina a &T. You have now UNC Greensboro, which used to be Women's College. You had Greensboro College and you had Guilford College. You have all these schools that some are fairly well known, but they're attracting people from all over the world. And they're encouraging people to be led out to their fullest potential. I got you. So you're bringing people here from Germany, from, from uh, uh, the other parts of the states, and they're coming and they're saying this, Jim Crow, black codes and Jim Crow. And they're saying, this ain't right. You know, or you got these people being educated and, and starting to read more and saying, this is not right. I got you. And they're going home and saying, we need to make a change. Most of the young you. folks. And so that's what those two dynamics or what made Greensboro such a rich centerpiece, centerpiece for social justice. The most famous one, which they have a whole museum on, uh, and of which we have a lot of uh, social justice, uh, civil rights icons like Reverend Jesse Jackson, uh, who graduated from North Carolina a his kids went there, and several more. Ron McNair, who uh, we lost at the shuttle explosion. Right, right. But um, you have these folks coming here and you're, they're saying, this is not right. There was a white business owner that pushed those Greensboro students in February 1, 1960. And I'll talk fast because this is not the subject, but it kind of lays the groundwork. Um, what made the 19, February 1, 1960 sit in different than any other sit in? Because it took place in other places. But for whatever for a reason, the one in Greensboro is the one that set the flame and it was in all the papers all across the world. Sure. The reason being is because they had the local chapter of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. Sure. They had the high school here, Dudley High School, of which the Gama talked about as an alum. Sure. And they had the middle school and they had the Bennett College for women and they had a &T. They had already been talking about, we're gonna do a sit-in. The reason they chose the Woolworths is because the Woolworths was like the target of today. Matter of fact, when they, a friend of mine interviewed one of the a &T four, and they said, if you had to do it today, where would you go? And he said, I would go to Target. It's like Walmart, but it's a little more upscale. Mm. And uh, so it was the one-stop shop. You could go there and buy stuff, yeah, school, I got buy you. clothes. And so, um, uh, they were encouraged. Hold to on, let me stop you there. Now, Target people, we ain't saying y'all racist. <laughs> we just saying no, it's no, a no, no. type store. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, that's the disclaimer. Yeah. We ain't saying that. Y'all yeah. uh, can still sponsor the channel if you want there to. There you go. That ain't what we're just, saying. All right, go ahead. Just a one-stop shop. Yeah. And so they went to the uh, Woolworths, and th what happened was they had this whole group planted it, and they were afraid to go to their leadership. Uh, Chancellor Gibbs at AT, Dr. Willa Player, who was the first African-American woman to run a four-year institution, which was Bennett College. And uh, they were afraid to go to them because a lot of them had to be conscious of their funding that was coming from yeah, the state. Oh, sure. And so, um, but some, some way the students spoke with Dr. Player and said, hey, we're planning this sit-in. They, they were hesitant. But Dr. Player said, look, I support you, but you may want to wait until after the summer because who's going to sustain the movement when you go home? Well, and they said, okay. And so they kind of put it on hold, but they had all these people that had been meeting for close to a year. Well, the ANT4 jumped the gun. For whatever reason, they jumped the gun on February 1, 1960. And some folks were upset, but they said, hey, okay, we, we got to go now. It's go time. And so what made it different is they already had the infrastructure in place. And so on day one, they had the four people. By the next day, it was 33 students. By the end of the week, it was over 300 students. Students, more people were there, but 300 students participating in this city. And okay, that's hold on. Let me stop right there. When you say city and explain that, what did they do? Well, uh, you know, they could black black folks could go to the local Woolworths and they could shop and buy their clothes and stuff. But they also had a rest uh, a place where you could eat a diner. So it was a one stop shop. You come right. and eat, buy your right. clothes. Right. Well, they couldn't eat there because that was deemed as too intimate. You know, you shouldn't have the privileges eating alongside another white person, uh, a white person. So you couldn't eat there. Well, what they did is they went on February 1, pretend they bought a few items so people would think they were there to shop. And then they went and took four stools and refused to be get up, to refuse to get up until they were served. At, 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 the, at the eating place. At the eating place. At the place. counter. That's the picture mm -hmm. we see them at the counter. At the counter. Right. And so um, and so they did that. And then when the rest of the folks that were involved found out, they started supporting them and coming out in droves, you know, the each subsequent day of that week. Uh -huh. And um, that was that's all set up because you're bringing in this education. And again, you have this industrial patriarchal uh, industry. So the two were coming together. I got you. I got you. Well, there was a gentleman that I want to talk about that. Very, yeah, everybody yeah. knows about the anti-four. 
But this gentleman kind of helped set the groundwork for that. And then he became what some have called the Martin Luther King of Greensboro, North Carolina. Okay. And that's Dr. George Simpkins Jr. He grew up across the street from the campus of North Carolina A&T. His father, George Simpkins Sr., it was a dentist. His son, Junior, became a dentist too. But his uh, father, so they had a nice house. You okay, know, hold on, let me, let me stop it. What time are you talking about? This is in the, uh, so he would have grown up in Greensboro in the 30s and 40s, 1930s okay. and 40s. And so um, he goes off to school and goes to Meharry Medical College, comes back to Guilford County in Greensboro to work for the health department. But he notices his father, of course, is getting older. So he says, I'm going to take over my dad's practice. Always was a very competitive guy. He went to Dudley High School, which has alum like Deborah Lee, uh, Loretta Lynch, okay. uh, a bunch of ath athletes. It was the first black high school here. And so uh, he came from Dudley High School, but he wasn't an activist. Uh, so he was a dentist and he would love to play tennis and love to play golf. Well, in 1940, they built what they call the Gillespie Park Golf Course here in Greensboro. The same guy who redesigned Augusta National, where they played the Masters, built this course, Perry Maxwell. So it was the jewel of the city. Everybody from around the Southeast would come and play. They would have tournaments here. But it was not available for African-Americans. Okay. Now, African-Americans would try to play. But typically, if they wanted to play golf, they had to go to a neighboring city, Winston, Durham, High Point. And uh, a couple of Blacks tried to integrate uh, Gillespie Park. So what the city did is they built what they call Nocho Park. And they, it was an old cow pasture. They put a golf course on there, didn't keep it up. You could smell the stench, just wasn't the same. And so um, <laughs> then they said, what we'll do is we're going to lease the golf course to this white citizen group. And in order to play, you have to be a member. And of course, they wouldn't let black people be members. Right. And so one day, December 7th, 1955, uh, Dr. Simpkins and his five friends, they would meet at a gas station on, and uh, uh, he would shut his office down at 12, go home and eat, and he would meet his buddies at a gas station, and they'd decide where they were going to play. Well, they met at this gas station that morning, and you say, you know what? We're not going to Winston. We're not going to High Point. We're going to Gillespie, and it cost 75 cents a piece to play. They went to Gillespie, put their, each put their 75 cents down. The attendant wouldn't take it. The course director was away at lunch or something, and so they tried to sign the registry. The attendant took the registry from them. They left the money on the counter, grabbed their clubs, went out, started playing. It was an 18-hole course, beautiful course. So they get up, they're playing, they get back to the third hole. The director's back. The guy tells them, hey, there's some six black guys. I'm pretty sure he may have said something else. But he said, there's six black guys out there trying to play. And so the guy angrily goes out there, curses at them. They said Dr. Simpkins grabbed his club. He said he wasn't going to hit him, but he wanted him to think that he would. And he said, why are you guys out here? He said, we out here for a cause. And he's like, what do you call us? Curses at him. And so they, they get to the ninth hole, they decide, man, this is enough, let's just go home. A lot of folks think they got arrested that day on the course. At that time, they would send black officers to black neighborhoods, white officers to white neighborhoods. And they sent some uniformed black officers to each of their homes, arrested them that night, took them in. And uh, Dr. Simpkins accounts how he was just ridiculed, marginalized, undervalued, just, just berated by the magistrate, by the police, everyone, not knowing how competitive he is. And he says, I'm coming back. And he said, I'll they said, man, pay your little $15 fine and go on about your business. He said, no, I'll take this to the Supreme Court if I have to. Mm. Being prophetic, they didn't know he would. So he took this uh, case. It, they got found guilty and they were going to be sentenced. They appealed it and it went to the district court. The district court, they found out that some of the jurors had played Gillespie Park before. The judge asked him, how'd you play? He said, we paid our 75 cents. He said, oh. So but they got to be white people. Right. He okay. said, you can pay the 75 cents. They can't. OK, we see what this is. And he ruled in favor. Uh, by this time, it was the Simpkins versus the city of Greensboro. And he ruled in favor of them. The city of Greensboro appealed. it. The judge says, uh, you have to open that course on such and such a day. For black um, people. Right. Two weeks before it was supposed to open, the uh, clubhouse burned down. They shut down the whole course. And then they shut down every other recreational facility in the city, swimming, NOCO Park, you name it. If it was recreational, they shut it down because Greensboro was saying, rather than go into the business of integrating, we're going to shut down recreation altogether. Remember, this is the city that would say, we want things quiet, not necessarily peaceful. And you. so 
what happened though, tragically, the lawyers for Simpkins didn't include that decision by the district court in the brief. So I, I'm not a legal scholar, but apparently yeah. you have to get this information. When it got appealed to the Supreme Court, you have to get it in in a certain amount of time, otherwise it won't be considered. Yeah. So Dr. Simpkins drives up to New York, he meets with Thurgood Marshall, uh, asking him to take the case. He was the head legal defense for uh, NAACP yeah. at the time. Right. Thurgood Marshall said, man, I can't take your case because it's going to mess up my win-loss record, but we will give you some money for your publish. <laughs> oh, man, because he, right. yeah. okay. And, uh, but he told him, he said, you're going to lose. He said, I'm going to tell you which justice is going to vote against you. And he told him, I, I don't know the name, but he told him, this one's going to vote against you. They lost five to four. He even met with Bobby Kennedy. Uh, the chief justice at the time, Earl Warren, saw this. He was supposed to be in the pockets of the conservatives at the time. He wrote such a strong dissenting opinion designed to embarrass the state of North Carolina said, you really want to send people to jail? These tax paying people for playing golf? Some of these are veterans, you really want to send them for playing golf? So the Luther Mars, the Luther Hodges, I'm sorry, thinking of gospel, but Luther Hodges uh, uh, suspended the sentence. They were so embarrassed. And uh, so they didn't have to do that time. But in the interim, Dr. Simpkins now became an actor. He was before just a dentist, you know, that loved sports. But he now became an activist. He said, I'm going to get every last one of them back for mistreating us this way. And so he went to the local uh, high schools, including his alma mater, Dudley, found out how many faculty were not registered to vote. He went to a t North Carolina a t found out how many faculty, inclu including some political science PhD holding faculty that weren't registered to vote. He went to the chancellor and the principal and said, you got to get these people. This is embarrassing. And in, in 1963, there were 5,000 African-Americans registered to vote. By the early 60s, there were 12,000. He changed every city council people, person, voted them out. He changed the voting system from at large to district so minority communities could have representation. And on December 7th, 1962, seven years to the day, he was the first person to tee off and integrate that course. And uh, so he changed the social justice platform here in Greensboro. He was also a dentist. He had a student from North Carolina a t that came to his office, had an abscess tooth, swollen face, 104 degree temperature. And he, they had one black hospital, L. Richardson. It was full, it was the only black hospital, it was always full. They would have patients in the hallway. So he called the two other hospitals, Moses Cone, named after the Cone brothers, Moses Cone. They're the ones that put the money that financed right. it. So he went to Moses Cone. They said, yeah, we got room, but he's black, so we can't take him. He went to Wesley Long. They told him the same thing. We got room, but he's black. We can't take him. He finally got, was able to get him to, to L. Richardson and save the guy's life. And he was so angry, he convinced the student, along with eight other doctors, to join him and bring suit against Moses Cone. Mm. And in 1962, he filed suit against them to integrate and also to give privileges to black folks. Uh, they lost the case. It was appealed in 1963, and Greensboro was forced to integrate their hospitals. That case, that in November 1963, that case set the precedent for every other public health system in the United States to integrate. So he was the reason. He his case set the precedent. Norfolk and all these other uh, systems came in and said, "Okay, it happened in Greensboro." He today he's the reason. My wife, who's a midwife, for Moses Cone Health System is able to work there. He's the reason I was able to be born at the hospital that I was born. But little, no, little is known about this guy. He brought uh, a golf tournament. He was majorly responsible for what he used to call the Chitlin Circuit, the Black Golf yeah. Circuit in Greensboro. Charlie Sifford, he came here to play, Lee El, all, uh, all these folks. And so, but very little is known about him. You know, I was asked to do an interview about golf in Greensboro. And when I looked it up, his name came up. And I'm a product of Guilford County Schools. And I said, how come I don't know? Okay. about this now i understand why yeah but yeah. It, it just it just forces i have four guys four white guys happen to be watching my appearance they said we want to do a documentary on golf in greensboro but we want to make make it based around uh dr Simpkins. so we've embarked on a uh documentary called 450 and change okay each yeah. of them paid 75 cents a piece it equals four dollars and fifty cents and led to all this change i don't know if you can see it but yeah, yeah. Uh, we've been working on it for about a year and we hope to be finished by the end of this year. It may not okay. happen. Now, but, now, uh, what is, who are the guys in the picture? Those are the Greensboro Six. Those okay. are the Greensboro Six. And if you go on uh, 450andchange.com, you can see the trailer um, for the okay. documentary. We have. You got a picture of the, uh, of the doctor, the dentist? He's, uh, 
he's in there and I can pull one up. It's oh, hard okay. to see. But he was he's in a bunch, he was instrumental in bringing uh Dr. King here for his first visit to Greensboro. Okay. Um but yeah, he's he changed, he helped integrate the school system. He helped integrate banking off mere threats, you know, because he he just took off. He ran the NAACP from 1959 to 1984. Um, and he got death threats every day. Yeah, I was gonna ask you that. What did he face anything himself? Uh, they, he, they, they didn't try to bomb his house or nothing like that, did they? They didn't, but the thing that he had is, and I should have mentioned this in the beginning. When he was younger, when he moved back to Greensboro to take over his father's practice, he moved into his daddy's house. And he, he was strategic about that. He, did, he hated bills. So once he became an activist, he said, I'm gonna stay in my daddy's house. It was a nice house. He said, it's paid for. No one, and he was his own boss. No one could come to him and say, I'm gonna threaten your livelihood. I'm gonna take your job away if you keep this up. He's like, I make my own money. You know? Yeah. And he said, my house is paid for. Same thing about Dr. Willoughby Player, who was the uh, chancellor at Bennett College at the time. The state and the city came down on her, but it was a private Methodist college. You know, they didn't get their money from the state. She told them so. And she said, famously, we don't teach our students what to think. We teach them how to think. Yeah. You know, and so when, and same thing with Chancellor, with Dr. Gibbs, Wilmoth Gibbs at a and uh, I've read where when, you know, at the time you used to have a lot of white um leadership at these HBCUs. Yeah. But then they started changing and started putting black folks, but they wanted them to be safe. One of the things that was written about Dr. Gibbs, they said, he won't wow you with his brilliance. Now, I don't think that's that true, but it was written. He won't wow you with his brilliance, but he's, he's safe. In other words, he's not going to be a troublemaker should something pop off. But surprisingly, when they went to him, he told them the same thing. We don't teach our students what to think. We teach them how to think. And I love it. They went to the local white school, UNC Greensboro. It used to be UNC Women's College. At the yeah. time, it was Women's College, North Carolina yeah. College for Women. Yeah. The governor went to them, went to the chancellor, Chancellor Blackwell, and said, get those girls back home because they were supporting the movement. He, he wrote a letter and put an op-ed in the, in the newspaper, pulled his girls off campus. But they went to those other two schools and they said no. And so these were some of the things they had in place. Uh, they originally, before those AT4, they, and I call them the AT4, and not a lot of people here call them the Greensboro 4. I call them the AT4. Yeah, they didn't get the love from Greensboro till later. I love the city, don't get me wrong. But nobody was for them. They were against them. You know, but once they started getting notoriety and it became this international iconic moment, it was all of a sudden was the Greensboro 4. Yeah, I'm right, an Aggie, yeah. so I still call them the AT4. That leads to this question here, right quick. And uh, and it's, it's on the line of what you're talking about. You know, a lot of people say that. Uh, uh, integration hurt black business. That was our problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean by that. You know um, when we when we had to. You know, you know the, what I'm saying by that question though. The, the, money the integration did. hurt black business. The black neighborhoods left all of the black banks, whatever, whatever. It, it did. Then, we talk about a guy who did what he could to integrate that that golf course. Uh, what what's the what's the dynamic there? That okay, we had to do it because. What we had was inferior and we wanted to play compared to how we didn't build up our own golf course to rival theirs and 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 would have told them, hey, forget it, we ain't gotta come to yours. You ain't got we ain't paying you no money. Right. Well, I, I think it was more of we have, I don't know what the percentage of African Americans was in the city of Greensboro at the time. It's certainly not what it is now. Uh it's, it's grown, but they were still paying the same taxes. I got and they you. said, if we're paying these tax dollars to facilitate and, and maintain these public facilities, I we should you. have the same access to them. That's the and, answer. Right. And yeah. so uh, and he, he was a competitive person. So he said, no, just make things fair. I don't want an advantage over anyone else. He said, but just make them fair. And that kind of sparked it in him. And so he later became the go-to guy. Had a lot of power. They talked about how he used to walk on the golf course and the caddies would break their necks trying to get to him because they knew he tipped well. You know, and then he would all—he was always teaching people, especially if it was a young cat. He was always pushing them to be better. I love and, um, You know, and he took care of folks that would come to his office. And you're right. At that time, they had what they call the East Market Street Commerce. They had several folks, several lawyers and, and, and doctors and, and, and eateries and uh, grocery stores that were for the black community. And if you couldn't get if you couldn't afford a bus or take the bus, you could walk to your doctor's office. Right. You could walk to get fresh produce. Right, right, well, right. urban renewal, as it did in many cities, knocked all that out in the 70s. Right. 
And, uh, and it knocked out all those businesses, including where Dr. Simpkins' uh, office used to be. Is there, is there a, 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 some recognition of, for him, uh, a plaque at his home, or you know, anything like that to well, honor him? Well, that there is. We're doing the documentary. There is a, um, uh, what do you call it, memorial marker right outside of uh, Moses Cone Hospital uh, that depicts he and the other doctors, but it's mainly him. Uh, for integrating uh, the hospital system and setting the precedent nationwide. Uh, there's a, he was a big tenant. Golf was what he was known for, but tennis was his favorite sport. They said, you go to his house. He had trophies spilling out. It had two rooms full of trophies that would spill out into the hallway. And so the local tennis center is named, it's called Simpkins Tennis Center. It's named after, or Simpkins Rec, but it's a tennis center. It's named after him. And then they have a uh, elementary school that's named after him as well. So they have oh. Simpkins Elementary. Oh. Um, but the, the, the national impact that he made uh, was not known. There's a 41-year veteran of the local Greensboro News and Record named Jim Schlosh. Uh, and he's the one that told me how the white community responded to him. He would say how this one guy, he had a domestic working for him. She was his maid. She had a, a problem with her too, and she needed to get off to go to the dentist. He said, yeah, I'm going to let you off, but you better not go to that Simpkins fella. You know, like I said, he caught death threats every day. They would call him, say, we're going to blow up your house or blow up your office. Um, and uh, I lost my train of thought there, uh, Brother Anthony. I'm trying to remember where I was going. Yeah. How about this? Did he, did it, did it get so vicious? And, and we kind of come to a close almost on this. Did it get hmm. so vicious where he had to have people around him? Like, you know, some bodyguards looking out for him, do you think? No, I mean, I never, I've never read that. And, you, okay. know, you know, of course, I never met him. I watched everything from my interviews uh, yeah. that he did. He would talk about it, but he didn't seem too worried about it. You know, really? it was more the thing like, yeah, I got people calling me. He said, you know, crazy fellas out there. So I'm sure he was careful, but I don't think he had uh, security or anything out there. Yeah, you know, at some point where, you know, hey, I got to take this credible. I don't know what they're going to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, that, and, and, and his name is again. Dr. George Simpkins Jr. Dr. George Simpson mm -hmm. Jr. Now, Simpkins. is there a... Uh, Simpkins, S-I-M-K-I-N-S. Yeah, Simpkins. Is there... Um, a website or anything that we can learn more about him? You know what I mean? Just Google the name or? Just the best thing is to Google the name. Uh, plenty of stuff come up about his case, all the cases he was involved in. Uh, and then if you like I said, if you go on 450 and change, you'll, you'll see something. But some. no one has written a book about him at this point that you know of. Uh, no, from what I understand is he has a, a son that might be working on a book for him. Uh, okay. Yeah, but uh, okay. it's, it needs to be a movie or a book. No, okay. uh, I was going to say this guy called him the most consequential man ever to come out of Greensboro. The rival mayor at the time, the mayor who was his adversary, uh, whom our city hall is named after, Jim Melvin, he's still living. He's in his late 80s. Uh -huh. But uh, he went up against him a lot, but he ended up speaking at his funeral. And he said he's the Martin Luther King of Greensboro. And when man, you read and see all he did, I was like, oh, he wasn't saying that just to be I yeah. was the word, be yeah. hyperbolic. He meant that. Yeah. Because of all the things he's brought and more people should know about. Him. Yeah. Well, that's what we're here on the channel to do is put them stories out there. And everybody that 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 I'm telling you, you ain't heard about that guy. This is mm. what we do on Strong Israel. We give people you ain't heard of. And so I thank you for 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 coming on the channel and telling. Is it? Let me before I before I go into that kind of close. Is there uh, uh, some point that that you wanted to make that I a question I have not asked you anything like that? Uh, just one of the things that it reinforced. I kind of knew this, but when I realized I went to school here and didn't hear about him, it's because they don't want a lot of folks don't want you to know about a George Simpkins. It might inspire you to do something, but it's Damn. also those who you don't you shouldn't matter, and this person might make think you matter. Might yes. make you think you matter. Yes. And so it became my mission to develop this, yes. you know, not for a documentary, but I was trying to, I'm going to create a curriculum for the schools here to yes. learn more about them. And, uh, yes. but learn more about these people. And like you said earlier, pass yes. it on. Yeah, pass it on. Matter. There you go. Everybody, strong inspirations. This is what we do. We, we find these people and, and, and then we let them do the talking and let them tell these stories. So uh, to you, my brother, I say thank you so much for spending time with us. Everybody, come on and uh, watch my movie, read my book. Let's wait on his movie, and then we're going to go to the premiere. We coming. <laughs> when you got right. that premiere, man, we're going to be there. I I'll let tell you people know. to come on and make it and, and blow it up so people can Absolutely. hear this. 
Uh, I thank you so very much for, for coming on the channel. And I want to say with all sincerity that I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind, stay learning them, them, them little known stories and passing that knowledge on and doing all that you do to educate them people and, 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 and enlightening us and inspiring us. We really thank you uh, so long. Uh, for now, we'll be back in touch. We out.